Welcome back to The Response, a bi-weekly interview and audio documentary series where we explore how communities respond to disaster, from hurricanes to wildfires to reactionary politics and more. I'm Tom Llewellyn. We're excited to announce that we'll be changing things up for season five, and new episodes of The Response will come out every other week. In addition to the consistent schedule, interview episodes like this one will also be available on YouTube. So now you get to know what we look like. We need your help to grow this channel. So please like the video, subscribe, and let us know what you think in the comments. Today on the show, we've brought on Joshua Potash to talk about mutual aid. Joshua is an anti-capitalist abolitionist based in New York City. He co-founded Washington Square Park Mutual Aid, which provides free food, clothing, and various supplies once a week in the New York City Park. They also co-host events like film screenings, skill shares, and various trainings. The group was founded in response to NYPD violence with the aim of creating a counter-narrative and being a community hub for folks in the park and around the surrounding area. In this episode, we explore some of the history and theory behind mutual aid and how it presents a counter-narrative to capitalist ideology and a practical pathway away from it. We also learn about Joshua's work on the ground in New York City and discuss the concepts of municipalism, police abolition, and more. And now I'm going to pass it over to Robert Raymond, who will be conducting today's interview. Welcome to the response. It's <laughs> great to have you on. I'd love it if you can introduce yourself and yeah, just maybe give us a little bit of a background on how you came to do the work you're doing. Yeah. Hey, Josh here. It's, it's really good to be here. Thanks for having me, Robbie. I started as a teacher in New York and... Gosh, yeah, I was always so exhausted <laughs> after a day of teaching that I didn't get as involved in, in this, you know, the sort of political work. But then when that ended, I really, you know, really it was the summer of 2020 that led to, to the mutual aid work. Because after months and months, you know, there's a, a core group that kept going out in the streets, kept protesting, kept being attacked by the NYPD. And after, by the really by the spring of 2021, people were, were tired of, of smaller, you know, fewer people in the streets, smaller protests, getting beat up. And I think where a lot of us in, instinctively turned, but also, you know, folks were reading and talking, but there's also an instinctual turn to like, okay, fine, we got to build this from the ground up. And so that's what led a lot of people to jumping into mutual aid, I think. And yeah, maybe, maybe I'll save the, the Washington Square Park origin story for a second, but that's kind of, that's where I got into this mutual aid work in general. And then other community organizing type of stuff as well. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thanks for for sharing that. And yeah, we'll definitely get into your work with the mutual aid group in a bit. But I, I guess I wanted to just sort of start out kind of with a, a bird's eye view. So this idea of like mutual aid, th this show isn't explicitly about mutual aid. It's it's more of like broadly about how communities respond to disasters. Yet over and over again in our documentaries and interviews, like the concept of mutual aid has come up and it's very like quickly became obvious to me how important mutual aid is when it comes to like organizing communities. And yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it's a central, it's a central pillar to the, to the show. And so I thought it would be great to have someone on who could really dive into mutual aid and, and someone who does mutual aid work on the ground. And so, yeah, I think it would be great if you could maybe just walk us through like a, a history of like mutual aid, where it started, what it is, what it isn't, and like why you've decided to focus on mutual aid in, in your work. Wow, I wish I wish I was the person to give the full and total history, but um, you know, I think what a lot of people know is the history of the term dating back to Peter Kropotkin and his look at at how our survival, human, humanity's survival, wasn't just based in this Hobbesian competition idea. This, you know, it, it's more complicated than survival of the fittest because we didn't survive as individuals. We survived as groups. We thrived and got, you know, <laughs> to this sort of dominant position in groups. And so the natural extension of that is that the groups that support one another and help one another survive and thrive are the groups that are going to succeed. And that's such a necessary intervention in a capitalist world where a lot of folks will still throw the sort of simplistic survival of the fittest at you or the strongest survivor and ignore how 
we still, I mean, in some ways it's, it's funny cause it's even more so instead of groups of 150, we're in groups of 300 million or whatever, you know, however you want to look at it, but you know, community, neighborhood, city, states like this, like, it's clearly as important as it's ever been. And so, yeah, mutual aid is the idea that we support one another freely. We give to one another freely. We provide for the needs of the people in our communities, not from profit motive, but just because, just because basically, because that's what we do. That's how we should live together. And to fast forward to the pandemic, I think the pandemic is where it became part of this is my own political evolution, of course, but I think the pandemic is also statistically where it went from, um, just a a large increase in the number of people practicing basically and learning and and trying to do it. And it's been around obviously in this country and others for way longer than that. You know, Dean Spade writes about trans communities taking care of one another, other marginalized communities taking care of one another. You know, I've talked to other people about this sort of inherent mutual aid or just communities where people are struggling, helping one another, you know, as simple as that, whether or not that name is there, the label is there. And I think recently it's become more formalized in a lot of settings since the pandemic. People have seen a need and just wanted to meet it together until they formed, you know, more and less formal organizations, a wide range of organizations to do that. And I certainly am a recent, you know, learner and am in kind of this more recent wave of people learning to practice mutual aid and, and trying it out, just doing their best to, to do it. One of the things that the, the ways that mutual aid pops up in this show often is like I was mentioning through disasters and it <laughs> is often, and like where you mentioned with the pandemic, it's like this idea that it often is filling in the gaps that the more formal structures and institutions mm-hmm. are increasingly and, and woefully inadequate on. And so, I mean, we look at, for example, Occupy, Sandy, which, which sprung up during hurricane Sandy in in New York city and, and what a huge, like just a huge impact that a group of people that were involved with that had on really saving a lot of lives and and helping a lot of people out in really serious ways. So yeah, it, it is very much, you know, just going all the way up to the pandemic. And, you know, we often talk about the pandemic as if it's a, you know, post pandemic, but we're still very much in the middle of a a, a pandemic. And I, yeah, I've seen mutual aid definitely as a concept and a practice explode in the last couple of years in a way that maybe it it hadn't as much, and maybe it was a little bit more isolated to, to individual disasters or individual events. But, um, yeah, so on that note, I'm wondering, do you see mutual aid as something that can actually seriously challenge capitalist ideology? And so it's kind of this idea that mutual aid is is different than charity, right? Like charity yes. being sort of like something that has a little bit more of a power dynamic imbued in it, whereas mutual aid is, it's exactly like the word implies, there's a more of a mutualism involved. Um, mm-hmm. And so in terms of yeah, just the different sort of ideological starting ground of where people approach mutual aid and and also just in the ways that it sort of exists as a way to allow people to see that there are, all, are alternative ways of existing in the world. I'm, I'm wondering if you think mutual aid has that power to to really challenge the current sort of economic political system that we have now. Yeah, I really like the way you put it in terms of showing people different ways of living in the world. I think that is one of the powers of mutual aid. The group I've organized with, Washington Square Park Mutual Aid, will be right there in the middle of Washington Square Park, which for those who don't know is downtown Manhattan near NYU, near just a place known for you know being expensive, fancy restaurants, you know, high-powered office buildings, all that stuff. And so when strangers walk by and we shout or have a sign or whatever, you know, free pizza, free clothing, free COVID tests, masks, whatever we might have, we often get this, like, really? You know, like, that's a fairly common response. Like, you sure? <laughs> and What's the catch? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How much? You know, like, and then some people do insist on giving us money and like, that's, that's cool. That's whatever. But for a lot of people, it's a glimpse, you know, a small glimpse of 
a way of doing things that's very different than what we all grew up knowing or definitely what I grew up knowing. And so that's, that's the, like kind of the tip of the iceberg. And then once you get organizing in mutual aid, I think it's much, it's that times 10, you know, that squared expanded and you become part of a community of people trying to give and giving of themselves, their time, their energy, you know, random people will agree to store stuff at their apartment or they'll go, you know, they'll leave work early to go to the storage and get things. And, you know, suddenly a collaboration with a church that you didn't, you know, emerges and all these, all these things where you see that people are interested in being selfless. And, you know, I think there can be, we could talk, you know, all day. I'm sure there's podcasts that talk about altruism all the time and this and that. And, uh, you know, who knows what it is, you know, who knows if selflessness and altruism exist in some absolute way, but there's examples of it and people are willing to do this, to do it and take action and give of their, of themselves, their money, time. And often with people who like class lines or racial lines or whatever might have attempted to separate them from. And so I think that's another way it can lead towards breaking down some of like, you know, the capitalist divides that keep us separate and try to view somebody as an enemy. You know, the big, big thing in Washington Square Park in New York and a lot of the country is like this scapegoating of the homeless as though they are somehow the problem rather than the structures and systems that deny them housing and care and all sorts of things. And so that's a big one that I, th I see a lot of groups, including Washington Square Park Mutual Aid, but others as well, breaking down. And we could we'll probably talk about this later more, but the, there's also the power element. Like you can build power with mutual aid as a component. I don't think it's the end all be all or anything, but I think it can be a component of building networks and power and gathering people who are united by anti-capitalism, kind of whether they know it or not. A lot of people don't know it at first or don't know it for some time. But if you're against the system that denies people housing and food, then you're against capitalism. So I think you can build that, build power in the community that way as well. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Thanks for that. And I, it might have been from a link to a tweet of yours. And for folks who don't know, Joshua's Twitter is pure fire. So make sure you, you follow him. We'll <laughs> for as long there. as it exists. For as long as it exists. We'll, we'll throw your Twitter account name in the, the, the show notes and, and all of that and, and shout you out at the, the end of this. But um, what I'm getting at is that there was a really interesting article I read about the difference between activism and organizing, which really made me think about mutual aid. And it's just such a beautiful way of organizing people, you know, and you have like these protests, these sort of one-off rallies, that kind of thing. Those things are great and they have their place, but you're not really building like a, I don't know. I, I feel like we've all had that experience where we come home from a protest and we feel this energy and like excitement and like a connection, maybe even to the people that were at the protest. But then it's like, now, now what do we do? <laughs> you know, and you yeah. can go out multiple times throughout a week, but it often feels like they, they sort of dissipate. And what I love about mutual aid and, and this idea that you're talking about in the work that you do is that you're building like long longer lasting communities like you're actually you're starting with like the human element and then you're building the politics and stuff on top of that whereas oftentimes it feels like i guess like very broadly speaking activism and and like these individual protests and rallies and stuff they kind of they start with the politics and then they sort of hope that maybe some connections are built you know uh but well, yeah, yeah so I don't know if you had any thoughts about that or if that's something that you've well, experienced. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts. It's really, I don't want to go off too far, but I think the recent climate actions have been, have sparked a lot of that same conversation, you know, what's activism, what's organizing and they can, and how can they connect and be connected? And yeah, I, I agree. I really like that. What you said about this like human centric and human first sort of thing, like, you know, connecting as people, building relationships, which I think is the foundation of all organizing. And then when you do that to a certain degree, you have the capacity to take actions, you know, to do things that might be perceived to some as activism, but hopefully you message clearly that you are welcoming people into your organizing ultimately. And so for Washington Square Park, there was a lot of intersection between attempts to stop sweeps of homeless camps and mutual aid organizing. And to some outsider, some of these events might seem like, well, what are you going to do? They'll just go sweep the next camp or whatever. It's like, 
no, we like we know these people. We're building with these people. Like these are our neighbors, friends, comrades, and ultimately, you know, networks were built, organizations were built, capacity was built to resist some of the sweeps. You know, it's not up against New York cops and sanitation in the city, you know, but capacity was built and ultimately people also learn and are learning to organize, which is a big part of it. So yeah, I love that distinction slash connection. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, for building on that. And yeah, let's talk about Washington Square Park Mutual Aid. Yeah. So how did you all get started? Sort of just give us the, the, the background and, and sort of what you do. <laughs> yeah, I think the origin story actually connects in ways that people might not initially think to this disaster focus. Here, the disaster, there's many, but the NYPD kind of was the dis art disaster. It's ongoing, of course, but there was a specific crackdown on public space in the spring, yeah, May-ish, 2021, um, seemingly provoked by wealthy people who lived around the park and, and in other parks in the city, you know, half stuff was happening in Brooklyn and the Bronx and elsewhere, but they the wealthy people who live around the park decided that they wanted a curfew in the park, specifically on the weekends. And, you know, that part of town is like, I mean, Washington Square Park is iconic, you know, hippies playing there in the 60s, 70s, you know, Bob Dylan in the village, whatever, all that stuff. And now it's a space where a lot of people who don't have 50 bucks to blow at the bars around the corner can come and just hang out. And so that means a lot of kids. It means a lot of black and, black and brown kids from Uptown or Brooklyn or, you know, students, uh, all sorts of people gather there, especially in the summer. And this was like, again, May 2021. So people were starting to gather, hang out there at night, play music, skateboard, all that good stuff. And when the police started enforcing these arbitrary curfews, the first couple times people didn't really know what to do. But then after the third or fourth, whatever, people started resisting and cops started getting violent and the sort of black lives matter, anti-racist, anti-fascist, like members of the community who are in those circles, like really wanted to push back against clearing people out of one of the, like, not only most well-known, but also one of the really few, you know, relative to the number of people, there's just so few free public spaces in this city. And, and so we did, we started putting, you know, people, masses of the people started gathering and started refusing to leave and, some, you know, it got violent again, but there was a different tenor to it of like resistance rather than just kind of victimhood or, or just police brutality. And after one of those nights that got more violent, there was a few of us at jail support for arrested comrades. And we just started talking. We're like, we have to change the narrative, change the game somehow. You know, people are talking about drug use and fireworks. And it's like these wealthy people who are talking about those things who aren't talking about community or they're not talking about solidarity. I mean, obviously they're not, but how can we get the story out? And so we just posted up the next week on a Friday by the, that arch in Washington square park that, you know, see, comes across in the media a lot. And we also asked a friend who often carries around a giant speaker to come. And so pizza and clothing and this one friend making little seed bombs and, you know, art kind of crafts and, speaker and it was like dance people dancing 10 11 by the fountain 10 11 p.m like hundreds of people dancing and it went from there we didn't really we first like marketed it on social media as like a jubilee or, you know mutually jubilee but then we're like why why wouldn't we do this next week and then you know then a group wanted to meet and talk and it just it went from there and it did you know it didn't 100 percent change the narrative or whatever but you know some articles were written and and the cops left <laughs> or they left they stopped the sweeping and the riot gear and all that. So something worked, something happened. And yeah, that was a year and a half ago and it's still going on. Mm, I love that story. And I particularly, I, I love that you all started in very like sp a specific sort of sweep defense context, but mm -hmm. it also sounds like you have just sort of like, I'm assuming organically like expanded to like a bunch of stuff. Like you, you do, you do reading groups, you do skill shares. I love that so much. Like the idea of, of marrying the sort of like activism side of stuff with like actually like learning, I don't know what maybe, yeah, maybe you can talk about like what you read, what kind of other programs you do, what kind of skill shares you do and, and kind of maybe like yeah. paint us a bit, a bit of a picture about that. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think to a lot of us there, it's very holistic. Um, yeah. So the reading group, first there was just like an article club reading shorter things. And then people wanted to read that book, Dean Spade's book, Mutual Aid to kind of, you know, there's some NYU students, there's some people who just live in the area who weren't familiar. Like we talked about before, bring, bringing people in, welcoming people into the work, to the organizing. And so, yeah, we read that kind of foundational mutual aid book um, and, you know, tried to break it down together. And then we were, and then after that, we read some fiction because, yeah, like Joy and Ursula Le Guin and she, also Radical author but fiction and and kind of in a similar way where people wanted to join the organizing join the article club and the book club in a similar way groups kind of just wanted to work together with us some groups because it's such a central space and it gets tons of people i think that's part of it so there's a great group called cinemobile which does kind of like pop-up movie screenings they joined us for twice i think three times for some movie screenings um some of the sweep defense organizers organizing that we talked about came to do kind of skillshare but also conversations you know different people talking strategizing there's been like knitting skillshares narcan trainings and yeah that's i think part of the beauty of it of holding the space in that park is that it is like a communal community space and it allows for people to gather which is kind of our you know part of our original intention that people should be free to gather here for free. And so, yeah, living up to those initial aims and then kind of building on it and building a place for people to learn and chat and get to know each other and, and build a community. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, I guess like, so broadening the conversation out a little bit again, like this idea of, I, I guess what I'm, I'm really curious about is like, your ch your theory of change if, if you have one and, and particularly like in the context of scaling the kind yeah. of work that you're doing and i know it's like kind of crazy to be like you know talking about like all of these really lofty ideas when you're just like on the ground trying to you know do some work in your community but really just like broadening it out just to, to have a little bit more of a theoretical conversation again, like one of the critiques that leftists commonly have around mutual aid and, and I don't know if critique is actually the right idea, but like an acknowledgement perhaps of its limitations is that they often do stay local and it's hard to like, you may get lucky to live in an area that has an excellent mutual aid group and like, you know, in, in your neighborhood. But how do these things scale and, and truly like change systems? And I wanted to ask you this specifically because I noticed that your current Twitter account name is Reed Jackson Rising by Cooperation Jackson. And you often put the names of, of books in your account name. And I, I love that. And so the reason I want to ask you about that is because, you know, Jackson Rising, oh, well, I'll maybe just let you, you explain like why you brought that book into your, your sort of like your username and yeah. specifically like this idea of federating out, right? Kali Akuno of Cooperation Jackson, who's part of Jackson, of Cooperation Jackson, which is, you know, behind the book, Jackson Rising, mm -hmm. talks a lot about this idea of federated hubs and municipalism and all that. So I'd love to know, like, sort of what, what you uh, take from that and why you feel like that's an important thing to highlight. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot there. Yeah. And it's all good. <laughs> it's all important, I think. So in terms of where to start, I think the critique of the limits of mutual aid is, you know, valid. I think that's a good starting point. I think it's really easy and normal and natural when we get involved in an organization or in work to like start identifying with it. And, you know, if you help start a group or if you view yourself as like a core member to you know defend it and i think mutual aid is, is very worth defending but i think some of the critiques come from this black and white place and i don't know if it's twitter or if leftists have just always been like this but we, you know we want to critique each other to make each other better but how can we do so in a way that's not black and white so rather than like is mutual aid good or bad for me it's like is mutual aid enough or not. And to me, that leads into a slightly different place where it's like, no, it's not enough by itself. 
but it's a piece of the puzzle. And so, yeah, Cooperation Jackson, they have many puzzle pieces or like pillars that they talk about, several. So cooperatives, you know, worker cooperatives, worker-owned cooperatives, political education. To me, mutual aid is one of the pieces with these other things. And that mutual aid becomes more powerful if it's federated or working with in a, in a clear and like powerful network with other mutual aid groups or or related groups. They don't have to exactly be mutual aid groups. So it's not, it's not easy. You know, that, that part of the process isn't easy, but mutual aid groups in New York are in touch. And those sweep defense networks came largely from multiple mutual aid groups working together and collaborating. And I, I hope we can continue, continue to do that. I think that what you alluded to earlier, this post pandemic situation has also led to a decline in, in mutual aid work in some areas, but the capitalist crisis continues, even no matter what people, you know, think of the pandemic. And so I think we are constantly being pushed towards solutions, basically, you know, the contradictions, the circumstances, conditions, whatever, push us towards push me at least and a lot of people I know towards finding solutions. And one of those is, I think, federating mutual aid groups and, and working together as, as mutual aid groups across a city or a region and hopefully scaling up, but keeping that base, that kind of, that very human center, like individual people working in small groups as the base, I think is, is powerful. Yeah. I think that's, I guess the only other thing I would say is there's you know, I don't just do mutual aid for this reason, largely. I'm a big believer in like community organizing and in my neighborhood, I also am part of like a community organizing collective because which, which that group, that community organizing collective is also invested in mutual aid and partners with the local mutual aid group and stuff like that. But yeah, is intentionally building power in other ways as well beyond mutual aid. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. And this idea of like the, the social change map that you can have lots of different roles within yeah. you know, the, the movement. And I think that I, I love how you framed uh, mutual aid as, as a one important part and that there's lots of other parts and it's incredible that you're involved in, in a number of different aspects. Like, thank you very much for all the great work you're doing. And I guess just to, to wrap up here, just wondering if there are any final thoughts that you'd want to share anything that we haven't talked about yet or anything any final messages you'd like to impart for our listeners but also any books resources that you direct folks to or if they want to learn more about mutual aid you mentioned dean spade um and any advice like on ways to plug into uh, that's your actually, community yeah. right that's what and, i was just thinking about yeah i mean yeah. i definitely recommend the book mutual aid by dean spade and obviously jackson rising Operation Jackson. But I, yeah, I was just thinking about how hard it can be to walk into a space where you don't know anybody. And as simple as it is, I think that's one of the single biggest barriers, just social, you know, dist <laughs> a different form of social distance, just feeling alone or, you know, you know, disconnection. So I, my the advice I always give, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, is just to f talk to that one most radical or progressive or involved organize the activist -y friend and tag along. Um, if you can't do that, you know, I talk to some leftists sometimes who are in the middle of nowhere and like jump on a Zoom call. There's so many organizations having great like Zoom conferences and speeches or, you know, talks, book, book talks, whatever, you know, it, it's out there. Look on Instagram, look on Twitter. one day take the plunge. You know, you don't need to jump right into an organizing meeting. If a mutual aid group is hosting a giveaway, go to the giveaway and like, or the distro distribution, whatever. In, in Washington Square Park, people who I've never met before sometimes just hop behind the table and are giving out pasta or chicken or pizza or vegetables, you know? Yeah. I think this is the actual last thing I'll say, <laughs> unless you ask another question. One of the beautiful things about mutual aid, and it's not always true, but it, should be true and often is true is that people will treat you differently there people aren't looking to get anything from you and they'll be excited that you're there to help it's different than a workplace it's different than you know a school or a competitive environment or you know it's yeah i think you'll see the difference if you if you show up whoever's listening yeah 
And yeah, thank you so much for that. I think that's excellent advice and a great direction to point people in. And how about before I let you go, where can people find you and how can, if people are in New York City, if they're in Manhattan, if they want to join in with the work that you're doing specifically, where, where should they go to find out more about that? Um, yeah, support WSP Mutual Aid on Twitter and Instagram. It's great work being done. And if you're ever in New York, Washington Square Park, can't miss it. Fridays, 5 to 9. Every Friday, rain or shine, pretty much. And yeah, come get some free food, talk to people. And find the, yeah, find the group on Instagram and Twitter. And obviously, folks <laughs> always appreciate financial contributions if you, if you want to toss that to the mutual aid as well. But yeah, just showing up is, is the best. So yeah, thank you. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks for sharing all of that. And yeah, just thank you so much for, for coming on. This has been awesome. Yeah, it's been great to talk. Thanks for all the thoughtful questions. Really appreciate it. You've been watching the response interview with Joshua Potash. To learn more about Joshua's work, follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Joshua Phil with three L's. You can also find out more about Washington Square Park Mutual Aid by searching for at WSP Mutual Aid on Twitter. We'll put the links in the show notes. You can find more content like this by subscribing to our channel, following at Response Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, listening to the podcast, or visiting the responsepodcast.org. Until next time, take care of each other. <laughs>